Dr. Dowell is an associate professor in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology and computer science at the University of Colorado Boulder. She's a member of the Lin Linda Cernick Center and, the, and a Bediter investigator. She uses computational biology and molecular genetics to decipher transcription regulation and the activity of transcription factors. She's a dedicated educator focused on bringing bioinformatics and data science to the University of Colorado Boulder. And she's also a co-founder of a Boulder Biotech. Um, with that, I'll turn it over. All right, thank you. I think you've heard a couple of amazing themes already from the talks this morning about um, both the, the pleasure of big data and many of the limitations, particularly when the data is not necessarily the correct data or maybe the data is dirty. And I think you'll hear me echo some of those in my talk today. But what I want to talk about is a problem that has perplexed me for a long time. And pretty much my entire professional career, weirdly going all the way back to high school. And that is shown on this page. How do I read this? What's encoded in this page of the human genome? How is it that when mutations occur within this page, between one person and the next, that gives rise to all the wonderful differences we see between every individual? And those kinds of simple questions of how we encode information into a simple alphabet are the kinds of questions that have sort of consumed me um, during my professional career. This language was described by Francis Collins as the language of life, because it has obvious impl implications should we be able to really decipher how we encode all the parts of biology into this book for, its for what that could do for both biology and medicine and many of the human ideals that we've talked about yesterday and today. So the Human Genome Project was launched on the idea that this would have a tremendous impact on medicine, and the human genome was completed just over 20 years ago. And so what have we learned about decoding this language in the last 20 years, and have we really met the promise of what the human genome claimed it would provide? Um, the same Francis Collin who described this as the language of life stated around the time that the human genome was complete that it would radically change medicine within 15 years. I don't work in medicine. I'm not going to state whether it has or hasn't. People have lots of opinions about whether it has or hasn't. I think it has had some good impact. I think it has not, perhaps, entirely lived up to its potential. So this language is a very simple one. It's composed of four characters, A, T, C, and G, the canonical four characters of DNA. Those characters are composed together into words, or amino acids, and those words are brought together into sentences that are basically proteins. And this is very analogous to the language that we speak. So the, 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 the thread you're going to find I talk about today is thinking about the genome as a language and how do we come to interpret or understand a new language that we've never seen before. So I'm not going to focus a lot today on a lot of the hard mechanistic details of the biochemists and the molecular biologists. But I'm rather going to take the data scientist perspective, and unfortunately, that means it's a lot of statistics. So when we have a new language, one of our goals is to try to interpret what did the symbols mean. So here's an example. I will tell you that this is a human readable English sentence encoded into a simple cipher. And these are the sorts of puzzles that are in my kids' logic books that they work on when we're taking long drives. And if you stare at this long enough, you'll start to see that there are certain patterns that emerge. So here is a three-letter word with three symbols, the, the, the snowflake being the first one. And if we look carefully, that same pattern occurs multiple places. And if you're familiar with English, you know that one of the most common words in the English language is the word the. And therefore, you might postulate that the snowflake represents a T. And by using that representation, you can go back through many of the other characters, start laying them into place, and break down until you can finally decode the message. What did you have to do to be able to decode a message like this? You had to look for patterns. You had to know going in what words were and what the frequency in general of some of those letters and words are in typical spoken English. These ciphers, while relatively simple and crackable by statistics, can get arbitrarily complex. So in 1969, the Zodiac Killer sent in the mail this cipher, which has came to be known as the 340 cipher. This is fundamentally encoded similar to the message I just showed you, 
But it took us 51 years to figure out what this message was, says. And it was actually just cracked this past December, in December of 2020. It was cracked by a team of three people, international team. The American of the team was a cryptologist, this guy named David Ornacek. And he said something very profound when he was interviewed about cracking this code. He said, when I first started looking at the Zodiac Cipher all those years ago, now he, he joined the cracking team in about 2006. He thought, I can solve this. I'll just write a computer program to do it. This you know, gives this impression of it being easy. I think that tells you something about most data scientists and their particular hubris when it comes to these kinds of biological problems. But then he goes on to say, but it's been kicking my ass all this time until now. And the key to the Zodiac Cipher and the thing that made it hard were two things. One, you don't know where the word boundaries are, so you lose that piece of information. But then the other thing is it's not actually a linear code. There's a wonderful article on how they cracked the cipher, but he encoded words in diagonals in this particular encoding, and it was a little bit of figuring out the right frame of reference that was necessary to really crack this one, and it took us 51 years. So maybe it's not crazy that we've had the human genome for 20, and we still have a lot to learn about it. In the human genome, particularly at the time that it was being sequenced, we understood that there were a lot of things encoded in this message. And in particular, proteins are one of the, the main machines of biology, and their encoding was really fundamental. And we knew this encoding before we started sequencing. And that is that there's a triplet encoding, that three letters of the DNA sequence encode for a single amino acid. You could think of these as a word. And that you can combine these words and look for an AUG to start and a stop code on to stop and find the sentences. Three-letter encoding is actually an interesting one because it so happens that in World War II, it was a three-letter or three-cylinder encoding that was used by the Nazis for the Enigma machines because three letters allow us to represent an awful lot of information. But if I want to look for these sentences, I can do that completely statistically. And in fact, the earliest genomes were completely annotated protein coding-wise simply by these three-letter word patterns. But we don't know how short of a sentence biology is allowed to use. And we know that as we get into higher eukaryotes, these words can be interrupted by long stretches of introns that really don't code for anything. And so to make our encoding better, we needed to add information to this. So it's important to realize that this language is encoded in the biochemistry, in the biology, and all we're doing is taking that biology and saying, what does this imply to the sequence? So we look for patterns, and we improve upon those patterns by bringing in another tool, and that's evolution. So at the end of the human genome, we had all of these sequencers all over the world sort of now sitting idle, not really, because we weren't fully finished with it, but, and it was like, what do we do next? And it was quickly realized, let's just sequence everything. Sequence lots of species. And the reason for that is that if you look out over evolution, if I compare myself to a fish or a mouse, if something in my genome is important, it will be conserved. And so as you go further out over evolutionary history, the exons, or the key parts of those sentences, pop out. And it turns out, sort of serendipitously, that the mouse was the perfect evolutionary distance for identifying proteins. But unfortunately for us, proteins, this, this language that we can decode by the patterns and by the evolutionary footprints, is only a tiny part of the genome. What could we possibly have missed by staring at mostly the proteins? And this is where I came in as a graduate student, actually. So I was working in the lab of Sean Eddy, um, and we were looking at the second major class of molecules that are encoded in the genome, the ones that at that point were largely lesser, and those were these structural RNAs. And these don't conserve primary sequence. They conserve the long-range interactions between positions in the sequence because that's how they fold up and function. And so the words here are a little bit more cryptic, but I can still find them by using evolutionary algorithms. In human English language, this is like diagramming a sentence, identifying the noun and the verb. They're not necessarily next to each other, but they're in most of our spoken sentences. And evolution in this scenario becomes critically important. So 
With just this written language, we have the capacity to understand structural RNAs and protein coding regions. But what else is encoded in that genome? The other major thing that's encoded is how are these things read out? How do we know which parts to read? And we start to get a hint that this reading is just as important, if not more important, than what I'm reading out. But when we look at cross species, and this was discussed a little bit yesterday, we can identify variations between individuals that make one person more susceptible to disease than the other. These SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, turn out that the ones that are associated with disease are not predominantly in protein coding regions. They're not predominantly in these structural RNAs. They're in the regions of the genome that are the switchboards that control when a certain region is spoken, when you turn on a particular region. And so the regulation or the speaking is largely controlled by a set of transcription factors that bind to some segment of DNA and then decide which part you're going to read out. So now we've transitioned suddenly from trying to read a written genome to trying to listen to what it's saying. And it's not a wonder that this is important, because when we communicate to each other, we don't just communicate through writing, we communicate through the spoken word, and intonation becomes very important. So I don't think he should get this job. I don't think he should get this job. I don't think he should get this job. Or I don't think he should get that job. Totally changes the meaning depending on where I put the emphasis. In biology, the genome is read. Maybe not this way, more like this way. Parts of the genome are transcribed into RNA, and we heard wonderful talks yesterday about the RNA component. And it's, in fact, the differences in which parts are read that make the cell type differences throughout your body. And we sort of knew this, and so somewhat shortly after the genome was completed, we launched into the ENCODE project, and the idea was to listen to the genome for, for, for the first time in gory detail across many tissues and to figure out where all those transcription factors bind and what's being read. And the better we got at reading the genome, the more we realized that we weren't in the protein coding just listening to a single loud voice. There were many other smaller, gentler noises going on in the background. This is a little bit like hearing the acoustic single soloist versus hearing the entire orchestra playing. And within that orchestra, there are lots and lots of RNAs. The structural RNAs that we were already aware of, but many RNAs that don't appear to be structural, and they don't appear to encode an open reading frame. And so it became kind of a challenge to figure out what's all this stuff doing. But it was also kind of a distraction from trying to decode the genome. Because what ENCODE showed us was that we can read out which parts are being spoken. And in a part of ENCODE I didn't talk about which parts are being bound by those transcription factors. But we still couldn't put them together to come up with a coherent model of how regulation is actually working. So one of the themes that you heard in the last talk, and you heard a little bit even with Aaron's talk this morning, is that sometimes the problem is the data itself. And so Turns out, I'm going to make the point that we were measuring the wrong thing. So when we measured what the genome was saying, we tended to listen by pulling out all the RNA, your classical RNA-seq assay, microarrays before that. But this is steady-state RNA. You don't know if it was made two seconds ago or six hours ago. If we want to understand transcription, we need to look at the process of transcription itself. If we want to understand regulation, we have to look at what's the actual machinery doing that makes it. This is the difference between if I want to understand how to make a car, I don't go out and watch cars on the street. I go to the factory and I see how they put them together. So does it matter? So my lab has spent the last 10 years, really, um, working on reading out actually what polymerase is doing. We do that through something called nascent transcription or sometimes called gross heat. And it's a very different perspective on the genome. So the bottom track here is your classical steady state assay. You see the beautiful exon intron boundaries. It's mature messenger RNA. It's refined. The cell has done a lot of processing on it. It's a little bit like the Facebook reel or the Instagram reel that you present to yourself online, of yourself. Gross seeks messier. Stuff is transcribed on both strands. It's transcribed everywhere. There's bits of it that are transcribed and never seen. That's kind of more like real life. Okay? So what does all this unstable transcription do? Fact of the matter is, we have no idea. We're still working on that. 
As you heard yesterday in Jesse's talk, inherently in any of these signals, any of these data sets, there's both signal and noise, and it has been argued that many of these unstable transcripts are simply noise. But there's an interesting thing about noise. So one, if you listen carefully, you will often hear sounds embedded that you didn't realize were there before. So I'm gonna tell you just a very quick story. The Colombian government was concerned that they had many of their military people being um, kidnapped by terrorists, taken into the forest, and were being lost, sometimes for as long as a decade. And what they knew from those that they had rescued was that about the only thing that the prisoners were allowed was access to the radio. So the Colombian government needed a way, the military in particular, to talk to these military individuals that had been um, gathered. And so they embedded into the radio Morse code signals and then broadcast in a government-owned radio songs that had Morse code encoding. Sounds like noise, meaningful for those prisoners. Unfortunately, when you start looking for those signs and symbols, you can often also be misled. There was a hypothesis in the late 19, or middle 1960s that Paul McCartney had died. People got this hypothesis from looking at the lyrics of a lot of Beatles songs and listening to particular Beatles songs played backwards and hearing things that aren't actually really there. Turn me on, dead man. Something we perceive that's there, that's not really there. So I want to end with one last comment on how noise can be beautiful. And this one comes from astronomy. We heard some stuff about astronomy yesterday, too. When we started turning antennas up to the sky to listen, the better our antenna got, the more we heard various noises. We spent years and years and years trying to remove those noises, trying to throw them out, trying to say, you know, maybe this is the antenna itself, maybe this is just white noise. But Pinus and Wilson did something amazing with that noise. They grabbed the noise, and they came to the realization that the noise was systematic, and it actually represented cosmic microwave radiation that was evidence of the Big Bang. And it was the first physical evidence of the Big Bang, and they won the Nobel Prize for this. So sometimes that noise, which, yes, it's still noise, if we want to hear out what a black hole looks like, we've got to get rid of this, but sometimes it's beautiful. So let me go back to the transcription thing. So how is this actual measure of transcription helping us decipher the genome? So what we noticed in my lab and several others was that when we looked at these nascent transcripts, these, these things that polymerase itself is throwing out but are unstable, they correlated really well with sites of transcription factor activity. And in fact, we could then flip the problem, take all the sites of polymerase activity, line them up, and then take the sequence patterns and ask for a particular transcription factor, where does that transcription factor reside relative to sites of polymerase activity? And we saw things where there was co-localization, things where there's depletion, and suddenly we had a way to predict which transcription factors are present and active as activators and which transcription factors are present as repressors. Cute trick, actually doesn't have a lot of market value even in biology, until we started looking at drugs and other perturbants and saying if we take this same trick and we take, say, cells before and after a drug, in this case, Nutlin, which is an activator of P53, we see that when a transcription factor is activated, polymerase is recruited to that position, it transcribes, and we see this amazing co-localization signal. And so now we can take this to reverse engineer for any perturbant which transcription factors respond and how quickly do they respond. This example is P53. Each of these dots on the right is a single transcription factor. It works for lots of other perturbance. You hit them with TNF-alpha, you activate NF-kappa B, and you see the five subunits of NF-kappa B. You hit them with estradiol, you activate the estrogen receptors. It works very fast. If I hit them with flavopyridol, which is actually a transcriptional inhibitor, within 12 minutes I can detect that P53 has come up in many other transcription factors, and it works over time. It's a way of sort of reverse engineering but I could only get there by listening carefully to what was being said and what was being made rather than what was being stable. So where are we in understanding the regulation? The sequence gets us motifs. The binding got us to a whole bunch of sites being bound by transcription factors. But it wasn't until we heard what they were doing 
that we could get to the functional subset and get rid of some of the noise. So this idea that context matters, where the TF is functional depends on who is around it, is also in language. So here's three English language words. You can say them in your head to yourself, but what you will find is how you pronounce them strongly depends on the sentence that you embed them in. Because I can tear the package open, or she can leave the room in tears. Same word, different context. That's how regulation works. Unfortunately, the gory details are still to be worked out. So today, I've shown you a little bit how we can try to read the genome, how we can try to listen to it, and from that, hopefully learn what's embedded in that. Um, this leads me to the quote that I'm going to end on for myself, and that is that when I start, first started looking at transcriptional regulation, I really thought, I can build a computer program to solve that. But it's actually still kicking me in the ass. I don't have the until now yet, unfortunately. I feel much the same way. <laughs> um, so we have a question online uh, that um, gets at, um, you know, how, how do you get to this place where um, you're, th you're th really um, ready to use uh, math and computer science to understand biology? So I'll, I'll read it. It's an anonymous question. How deep does your understanding of biology need to be in order to do computational biology? Is mathematical expertise more important? Uh, that's such a great question, actually. Um, we used to, when I was a graduate student, sit around and argue whether it was better to be a biologist who learned computer science or computer science who learned biology. And unfortunately, I have no idea which one's easier because I have been um, the dead armadillo in the middle of the road from as far back as I can remember. I actually have two bachelor's degrees, one in genetics and one in computer engineering, and it stayed with me the whole time. I think that you know, if I want to oversimplify the computer science, people can learn technical skills, and if I want to oversimplify the biology, people can learn to memorize facts. But the fundamental reality is, is that deep understanding requires you to really focus on each in their own turn over time. Maybe that's just a way of saying that I'm not particularly good at either, but I try to find that middle road. Um, and math is always there. So we have another question um, that sort of gets at the scale of work and whether the sort of scale of work in biology needs to change. So uh, I'll, I'll read it again. Major physics work today has hundreds of co-authors on important work because of, the, because of the complexity. Does biology need to get there too? Biology is there. Have you looked at ENCODE or um, HapMap papers or these microbiome papers that have hundreds and hundreds of authors? Um, Authorship's an interesting problem with respect to who should be authors and who shouldn't, but we're, we're not going to go into that philosophical aspect of it. But biology is getting bigger, but I think the problem with getting big is sometimes you lose sight of the little details. And so ENCODE was one of these large projects that had hundreds of authors that generated lots and lots and lots of data, but in the end of the day, that data's ability to give us the fine mechanistic details on regulation has actually been quite limited. And part of that's not the realization they weren't measuring the right thing, and part of that's just because it became a factory. And so the creativity kind of got lost. And I don't know if that's true in physics, but it's certainly true in biology when it gets too big. Did you? Yes, uh, I, I was wondering, I mean, uh, the genome is incredibly complex, and, and et cetera, et cetera, and you know, I think the layer of, of its uh, we are finding more and more regulatory mechanism. Yeah. But what I was wondering is, what do you think is, could be the role of deep learning in this? Uh, so deep because you have not really addressed that. Yeah, so I'm actually formally trained in machine learning. And a lot of the algorithms that we develop are machine learning oriented algorithms, both supervised and unsupervised. We've done a little bit with deep learning. Um, if you have a pattern you want to detect or you suspect a pattern, deep learning is a great way to go looking for it. But the problem I find personally with really deep learning approaches is interpretation of what they found. You can build predictors sometimes that can accurately predict something, but you have no idea what they're predicting based on. And I think actually the talk last time about seeing the pin marks was a beautiful example of that. So I think the, the part with deep learning that needs to happen more is to figure out what they learned. And that turns out to still be a little bit hard. Yeah, but it's making a lot of But progress. it does make a lot of progress. Like there's attention networks. And yep. 
And I, I'm still wondering, I mean, like when you just start with this beautiful page with the code, you really wonder, you know, if there's not a way to use uh, this kind of approach yeah. more. Yeah, well, the other thing about so deep learning do you predict? is we need lots of data. Yeah, and, but there is more and more data. But what do you predict? Do you predict human disease? Do you predict? Yes, so there is that question, too. I so think I, for, I, for deep learning, it only works for supervised learning, really. So you have to have a predictor yep. that's useful. And I'm not sure, is it evolutionary conservation? Is it? But see, you can predict many things sometimes. But you do have to turn your attention in different directions. So I, I, I bad-mouthed ENCODE a minute ago, but then I'm going to turn around and say, a large data project like that, we found many RNAs that weren't appreciated before. Um, we've identified vast amounts of transcription factor binding in histone code in, and all kinds of things like that, that we've been able to turn deep learning to and look for patterns within. And so more data is in some ways always better, but more specific data is even better yet. Um, it's like feature. Exactly. It's like features to a deep learning model, yeah. Are there ways to potentially stitch together the, the sort of very detailed idea of nascent transcription with some of the steady state data and kind of deconvolve? That is almost a perfect description of what my lab is working on right now. Okay. <laughs> Excited yes, to learn more. <laughs> uh, so I, when the ENCODE papers started to come out, yep. I made a mistake. Tried to read one. No, I read, <laughs> I read many. I Xeroxed all of them because I couldn't stand to read them any other way. And I put them on a desk. And it was a very big stack. Yes. And I read many. I don't know whether it was five or ten. But it wasn't 50. Yep. Which is, I don't know what the number is now, but it's big. And once I realized that every piece of DNA was transcribed somewhere on either strand, yeah. using as the template either strand, I decided that ENCODE had driven itself to below the meaningful level and that I would never read another ENCODE paper <laughs> ever, <laughs> until this talk of yours. And, and so I'm, I want you to say something about how you can throw out silliness. I, I argue that evolution over the next 40 trillion years might figure out a way to use those minor RNAs yep. that are antisense, if you will, but that they have to be useless a little. And do you, do you share that? There's Absolutely. So here's my thought on the genome being transcribed. We are very comfortable in talking about sequence as having a random mutational process and selection deciding what's good and what's not. But somehow, when we step away from the sequence, we want things to be very deterministic. But in fact, making random changes in this genome are pointless if I'm not also sampling every step along the process. So I have to randomly transcribe just as part of that sampling process. And on some level, that's noise. And on some level, that's telling you something about the evolutionary process and the mechanistic process of how polymerase is recruited to a particular region. But I'm also very much like you in that I have a basement that is full of junk. And for the most part, the junk sits around. And every once in a while, I run into a problem where going into the basement and finding the right piece of junk becomes useful. And so if I'm transcribing that stuff, occasionally something will be useful, and selection's going to work on that. And so we have to bring the evolution back into our discussions of transcription, and we're only just starting to do that with nascent assays in particular. Now, it's been done with binding, it's been done with RNA-seq, but we're only starting to do that with nascent. Ask a possibly a related question. How do you or can you discern a non-specific effect of, that's due to presence of a collection of nascent RNAs that are all individually unstable, but they rise above a certain threshold where, you know, as a collection of polyanions, they actually um, you know, have an effect 
a non-specific effect yep. in quotation marks on at least a subset of proteins, among which, you know, there could be actual sequence-specific effects, but the, the baseline effect is just that they're there. In the same yep. way that, for example, ATP, which is present in cells at millimolar amounts, actually is known to stabilize the proteins uh, as if it was just a dumb salt. Yep. So the first part of your question was, how do we know? And I'm going to fall back on my genetic roots and say that the only way we ever really know anything is through actually doing experiments that test the causality. But then I'm going to focus a little bit more on the second part of your question statement, and that is, you know, could this collection of unstable transcripts, just by virtue of sort of being there, and particularly being at high titer around the place where polymerase is, have function, and function as an RNA? And there is some evidence of that in the literature. There's some evidence that those little RNAs may help to recruit particular proteins. There's some evidence that they may act as sponges. Um, I like to think about, if you go back to the 1970s, there were some papers that were done looking at the binding specificity of key transcription factors. And what was really amazing to me was that they showed that those transcription factors bind with more specificity to RNA DNA duplexes, for some, than they did to DNA. And then we sort of forgot that. And so it's completely possible that the transcription of these little RNAs is somehow improving the specificity yeah. of particular proteins in these little nucleated regions. Yeah. And those will be hard things to really nail down and prove, but absolutely. Can I ask I love this conversation. So you know that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I want you to uh, carry out a bit about someone who I've always thought of as an idiot, um, who created the field. This is John Maddox in Australia. Ah. And, and I thought, since his hypothesis was so uh, irrefutable, the hypothesis was they do something interesting, and until you find it, I will continue to tell you that our, he, he told us at Somologic once that the RNA network that he made up almost as though it went with the ENCODE papers, but he was before that, and he's very smart, yep. so I, I shouldn't call him a moron. But he did have an idea that was, it felt like to me it was not science. It was just a discussion about yeah. if it's there, it must do something. And of course, there are lots of things that are there that don't do anything yet, your point about evolution, but you have to wait a long time to find that thing. You might have to wait a billion more years. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't like that kind of science that can't be um, dismissed. Do you have an opinion about his work? So, so I, I like that John Maddock talks about big ideas because I think it's important to infuse conversations, particularly science, with ideas, sometimes radical ideas, sometimes radical ideas without basis. Even a stopped clock can be right twice a day. Um, but the idea, you know, I don't think that the idea that RNA was really important was actually all that radical when John was, was saying it. I mean, we had already lots of evidence from Norm Pace and Mark Yaris and various others into the importance of a lot of these RNAs, Jack Sostak, um, the importance of these RNAs, the likelihood that life originated with them, and so they should be residual in many places. In terms of actually testing them, we can wait for evolution, or we can add to our reading and listening to the genome this concept of writing. And in fact, last year's Nobel Prize went to writing technology. Um, I didn't really bring it into this conversation because it's not high throughput yet with big data, so it doesn't fit with my own view of the world, but it's going to get there very, very quickly. And if we can start to make all possible permutations and just ask what they do, we can sort of accelerate what evolution is going to do for us naturally. Does that make sense? So I think we should, we should do an online question, which I think is going to take us in a step back. And, and sure. Um, so that's why are transcription factor binding sites transcribed? <laughs> yeah. So transcription factor binding sites are transcribed because when the transcription factor sits down there and is in the right context to be functional, polymerase sits down. And maybe it doesn't know what it's doing. Maybe it's a mistake. Maybe 
those little transcripts are part of what changes the local context and helps to build that sponge. Um, on some level, and I, I hate to say this out loud because it's, it's horrible, right? On some level, I'm the one person nationwide who studies ERNAs and doesn't give a damn what they do because they're great markers. They tell us something about the regulation under the hood. And that's really the way we look at them. Now, we do have an interest in what they do, but that's a harder question um, because they are so unstable and they are at such low levels um, that the biochemistry gets tricky. I think Larry Hunter, did you? Ah, you're holding the mic. Uh, so <laughs> I think he's just holding the mic. <laughs> very confusing. Uh, so um, we have a question actually that goes to your, your introductory point about the Zodiac Killer's message. Yeah. What did the Zodiac Killer's message say? Uh, a lot of his typical boasting. Gotcha. So it was not at all informative in any way towards the case. You can actually go to the, I'll put these slides online. You can go to the, the article that was on the reference at the bottom and read the entirety of its conversion. He talked about the fact that um, just before that message had been sent, there was a guy online claiming to be the Zodiac and he said, I was not on TV. And he talks about not being afraid of the death chamber, those sorts of things, the typical, you won't catch me. And of course, 51 years later, we actually haven't. So he wasn't wrong, um, unfortunately. Um, and then another question uh, from online. Uh, great talk. What you, uh, this is from, sorry, I should read names. Uh, it's from Stephen Pollock. Great yep. talk. What you describe is a, is a systems problem where context and time, context over time are critical. Yep. Does this present problems in representing these dynamics? Yes. So we, you know, whenever you add additional dimensions, you add an additional magnitude of data that we need. And we have not been good. We've been good about generating lots of data on particular cell types, but not a lot of data over time, um, and not necessarily a lot of data about context. Um, I still say that one of the, the things that will help the most with understanding regulation is being able to reverse it and being able to say, here's a regulatory region, here's a particular time point and context, now tell me all the proteins that are there. That turns out to be an incredibly hard thing we don't have a method to do. Um, maybe someone logic could figure out how to do that with their aptamers. But you know, those context kinds of issues makes this a computationally hard problem. The, the CS people on both online and in the room know that you know, I sort of walked you through a left-right parser, a context-free grammar, and then said, well, now we're in the context-sensitive section. And context-sensitive grammars are way harder. They've, we've passed MP. And, and that makes it tricky. Um, and so uh, we've got another question from online. So, um, and I think, I think I'll probably stage this question, but uh, what it says is, would you argue that genetic sequencing as a diagnostic is very incomplete? And I guess what I might reframe that a little bit to is, are there cases where genetic sequencing as a diagnostic is really making a difference today? Are there cases that are kind of visible on the horizon? And then what are the cases that you see as sort of over the horizon at this point? So there have been some wonderful one-off stories about um, genome sequencing for diagnosis that have been effective. Um, I think this number changes periodically. I think the last time I read it, as finding a formal diagnosis, whole genome sequencing was only effective 13% of the time or something like that. It's, it's, it's surprisingly low. Medicine and disease in particular, we're more than our genomes. We are also, as we heard when we were talking about armadillos yesterday, we are also the function of all the things that have happened to us. And the need to track many of those things that have happened to us, that medical information, has to be brought in before we can fully represent and fully realize the potential of that genome. And that part we have less good mechanisms for. We heard that in the previous talk, and we heard that yesterday also as well. Genome sequencing for diagnosis is not going to be an end-all cure-all, but it is another tool for sure. Gotcha. So I think you know, that, that's a really nice theme to bring us to, because that really stitches, I think, the morning together in many ways. So let's thank Dr. Dowell. Thank you.